and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 27, where we're going to look at complementary angles when dealing with projectile motion. Up till now, we've dealt with a quantitative approach to projectiles. We've solved a number of equations dealing with projectile motion and used the big five kinematic equations in order to solve for them. We've used variables such as VI, A, D, T, and the special way that we use them for projectiles is by separating them into X and Y components. The fact that perpendicular vectors are independent allows us to do this. We treat the X direction and the Y direction as two separate problems. Now, what we're going to do at this point is look at a more qualitative approach and talk about concepts dealing with projectiles. Not every problem with projectile motion will have a solution that needs mathematics. Sometimes you'll talk about general relationships between different variables. In this case, I want to show you a chart of different projectiles being launched with the same initial velocity from the same point, all at different angles. And what we're going to do is analyze how this chart can be used. It shows a number of different um, dotted line paths, parabolic in nature, of projectiles going through the air. Each has a different range. You'll notice some of them land at the same spot, some of them are higher than others, and some of them go farther than others. And there's something to do with the angles at which they were initially launched that will allow us to determine which one has the biggest range, which one has the biggest hang time, which one has the biggest um, maximum height, for example. Now, in this case, what we're going to notice is a couple of things. The first being that the range of the projectile will increase as we go from 0 to 45 degrees. At 30 degrees, the range is less than 40 degrees. At 45, you have the biggest range you can possibly have. As we go from 45 up till 90, the range will decrease. So if we want to shoot an object as far as possible, what we're going to do is fire it at 45 degrees. Now remember, we are neglecting wind resistance. So in a perfect world where we could evacuate all the air in the system, 45 gives us the biggest range. Now there's a reason for that mathematically, and that's the fact that sine and cosine are as big as they can be at 45 degrees. You'll also remember from math class that 45 degrees, sine and cosine are equal. 45 degree angle gets you legs that are equivalent. Now, that being said, you'll notice that on the chart we do not have a second set of dotted lines for 45. And that's because the second set is actually on top of the first. It's superimposed on top of the initial because if I shoot it at 45 degrees twice, you're going to have the same exact range. Now, if wind resistance does play into effect, what we'll find is that 37 is your ideal angle. So for those of us who may be long jumpers, or those of us who are trying to get the biggest range out of a ball that we hit, or a ball that we strike with our foot, or with another device, we're going to try to use 37 as our max. So don't think that 45 will get you the biggest range when you're playing sports. Some sports have objects that are more um, well, resistant to the air. You'll find that a soccer ball can uh, be held up by the air a lot worse than a baseball, for, for example. A baseball will cut through the air better than a soccer ball. And that's due to the fact that the soccer ball has a larger surface area and the fact that it's inflated. In this case, a football could also be affected by more wind resistance if we don't have a spiral on it. So when you're kicking a football, there, there's less likelihood, especially off of a tee, that you'll be able to get a nice spiral with the ball. So 37 would be a good um, angle if you're trying to get the biggest distance out of the ball. Now there's different reasons to use these angles for different scenarios. But there's a couple other things I want to talk about first. And that's the fact that if we look at the angle measurements for these different um, projectiles, Every time we have a certain combination, they have the same range. And you'll notice that 15 and 75 land at the same spot. 30 and 60 land at the same spot. 
45 and 45 land at the same spot. Now what's special about these pairs? They're complementary angles. They add up to 90. So anytime you have a certain angle, its complement will land at the same spot. 10 degrees and 80 degrees would have the same range. Although that's not on the chart, you could make that assumption because the two angles add up to 90. So this chart gives us a lot of information. Now there is something else that matters. The bigger complement will get the longer hang time. It will be in the air the longest and it will also have the biggest maximum height. Now what if you were asked to find maximum height for a problem like this? Well what you would need to do is look at only the y direction. And there's something special that happens at the top. No, it's not that the acceleration all of a sudden turns to zero. Gravity doesn't shut off just because an object's at the top of its flight. But another variable does reach zero. And that would be the final velocity if we look at half the flight. So if you're asked to find the maximum height, you have two options. You can either divide the time by half, so t over 2, or you could say vf is zero at the top in the y direction. The x direction is constant throughout. We have the same initial velocity, we have the same final velocity in the x. The y direction would allow us to find hang time or it would allow us to find the maximum height. Now that being said, there are some times where you'd want to have a larger hang time versus a shorter hang time. If we're just talking about football, for example, and you're trying to punt, well what you want to do is allow your team um, an opportunity to get downfield. So if you're a punter, you don't want the ball to get to the receiver as quickly as possible. You want it to take as long as possible. You also want to kick it far, but you want to have a big hang time. So a punter would choose the 60 degree angle, let's say, instead of the 30 degree angle. However, if you're talking about a quarterback, for example, well, you may want to get the ball to your receiver quicker than the other team can react to it. So a quarterback will want to throw the ball at the 30 degree angle as opposed to the 60. If the quarterback just throws the ball up in the air, it's going to give the um, defenders time to get in position. So if the punter wants to get the ball to the same spot, let's say, as the quarterback, the quarterback will often choose the smaller angle as opposed to the bigger angle. Now, we may want balls to um, be in the air longer and then land in a position that will um, reach a goal. For example, in basketball, we'll often want to have a high hang time because the ball cannot go into the basket at a low um, angle. So in basketball, you may choose the 60 degree angle as opposed to the 30 degree angle because the ball has to go up and then into the basket that's horizontal. Now, other, other situations would require different angles. Now, if you're playing sports, you do this by feel. You're not going to sit at the field and calculate values um, on the fly. You get a feel for it, and you do this by repetition. Well, physics is no different. Physics is a mental sport. And what we try to do is learn how to do these problems by practice. The more practice problems you do, the better off you're going to be in the long run. So I think it's important to realize that as we're doing these problems, practice is important. I've done these problems many times. I can do new problems fairly quickly because I know the different tricks that can be um, thrown at us. What's important for you to realize is that this is the first time you're doing physics. So you need to practice just as you would um, in sports. If you want to get better at free throws, practice free throws over and over. If you want to become a better pitcher, you're going to practice over and over your different pitches. The same thing applies in physics. Watching someone um, solve problems is one thing, but you need to actually solve the problems yourself to get better. I've done this many times. I make this look easy. More importantly, I make it look good. But it's important for you to make it look easier for you. And the only way to do that is by practice. So I think what we're going to do now is after our qualitative day, I want this to sink in. Complementary angles get the same range. The bigger of the complements get a higher max height or altitude, if you will, and a bigger hang time. 45 degrees gets you the biggest range possible because in physics, in an introductory physics course, we will often ignore wind resistance. But if you are actually playing a sport, 
37 is your maximum. 37 is the best you can do because when wind resistance acts on an object, it will slow the object down and will not actually be in the air for as long as um, estimated. Now in a laboratory setting, if we're trying to hit a target, the wind resistance would be minimalized. We're not in a very windy situation. We're not outside. We can't suck out all the air from the room, but we can um, get pretty good results in a short amount of time. If you are outside and you're playing a sport, you're going to want to remember that 45, although ideal, theoretically, will actually not be your perfect angle um, in reality. On the Regents exam, on an assessment though, if they ask you what is the maximum range of a, project of a projectile, what angle gets you the maximum range, you better put 45 because that's the answer that they're looking for. If they give you an angle like 15 degrees and they say what other angle will produce the same range, well 90 minus 15 is 75 degrees. So you're going to put the complement of 15 in that case. Well that concludes the lesson for today about complementary angles and projectile motion. Thank you. All right, since we talked about complementary angles already having the same range, what I'd like to do is a calculation to verify this. And what we'll choose is an initial velocity of 30 meters per second and we'll fire a projectile at 15 degrees, fire it at 75, and see if we get the same answer um, for the range for each. Now, of course, our first step is going to be to resolve the vector into its components. We have 15 degrees, we have 30 meters per second, um, v cos theta for the x, v sine theta for the y. And if we do the same thing at 75 degrees, we would do the same calculation, V cos theta, V sine theta. Now when we plug them in, what we'll do is we'll separate our problems. We have 15 degrees over here and 75 degrees over here, just to see what we have. So Vx, Vy, Vx, Vy. Let's see how they're different. So if we do the 15 degrees first, 30 times cos 15, that's going to be 28.98 for the x, so 28.98 meters per second. And then 30 times sine of 15 is going to get you 7.76. Meters per second. Let's see how it is for 75. 30 times the cosine of 75 gets us, huh, look at that, 7.76 meters per second. And I have a feeling that 30 times the sine of 75, yep, 28.98 meters per second. Now that's because sine and cosine are reciprocals when you deal with um, complementary angles. So the 28.98 in the x becomes the 28.98 in the y for the 75, and the 7.76 becomes 7.76 in the other direction um, for the x and y for 75 to 15. Now when we do our calculations, what we'll have is x and y, x and y, let me switch markers, so v is 28.98, vy 7.76, vx 7.76, vy meters per second, 28.98. A is 0. A is negative 9.8. A is 0. A is negative 9.8. D is what we're looking for in the X, and DY is 0. 
D is what we're looking for in the X. DY is zero. All right, so now what I'll do is get some more room and we'll calculate the times. Substitute them in for the X and see what we get. Time, substitute in the X. All right, we'll do the second half of this problem momentarily. All right, my black marker is all used up, so I got to move over to blue. We've been doing a lot of physics this week. And what we'll do is we'll look in the y direction first. So we'll do v t equals vit plus one half at squared. Zero meters equals 7.76 meters per second times t plus one half negative 9.8 meters per second squared t squared. This will be a factor problem so 0 equals t and 7.76 minus 4.9 t. t equals 0 and t equals, we'll bring over the 7.76 divided by 4.9. So that's in the air for 1.58 seconds. So that's our time for the 15 degrees. We'll do the same for the 75. D equals VIT plus one half AT squared. Zero equals 28.98 meters per second. T plus one half negative 9.8 meters per second squared. T squared. Once again I'm going to factor out. So zero equals 20, uh, t times 28.98 minus 4.9 t. t equals 0. And t equals, let's see what 28.98 divided by 4.9 gets me 5.9 seconds. A significant amount of time. In All right, now after we solve for the time in the y directions. We're going to go to the x direction to find the range. D equals VIT plus one half AT squared. We're going to cancel out the AT squared term. We'll do the same thing on this side. D equals VIT plus one half AT squared. Cancel out the A term. D equals, and the x velocity was 28.98 meters per second times 1.58 seconds. And then for this one, d equals 7.76 meters per second times 5.9 seconds. Let's see if we get the same range. 28.98 times 1.58 gets me 45.79 meters. And then 7.76 times 5.9 gets me 45.784, 45.784 meters. Now I, I see that the um, 45.79 is not identical to the 45.784, <clears throat> but because we rounded so many different times, these are slightly um, off. However, that's going to verify in my book that the range is the same. If we left all the numbers in the calculator the entire time, um, we would have gotten the same answer. But what I was doing was switching back from the different directions. But needless to say, um, 15 degrees and 75 degrees will land at the same location. And that is because they are complementary.